Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, February 28th, we discuss a litigation update in the Thomas Jefferson High School litigation. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have an excellent speaker with us this afternoon, Nicole Neely. Nikki is the president and founder of Parents Defending Education, a nonpartisan, nonprofit national organization giving parents the resources and support they need to advocate for their children's education. Prior to launching PDE, Nicole created Speech First, a nationwide membership organization that defends college students' free speech rights through litigation and other means. Nikki is a longtime Federalist Society member, and we're delighted to welcome her this afternoon. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. After our speaker gives opening remarks, we will turn to audience questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle questions towards the end of the program this afternoon. With that, thank you for being with us today. Nikki, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Evelyn. All right, well, this is kind of exciting timing for this event because on um, Friday afternoon, actually, a decision came down in the district court, um, district court judge Claude Hilton, um, uh, issued uh, an injunction on behalf of the Coalition for TJ, which is really exciting. So I guess I'll start out just giving an overview of the case and kind of set the stage, and then we can move into what we were initially going to talk about, which is um, the astonishing amount of uh, materials that uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation, which litigated the case, um, obtained through discovery that we published on the Parents Defending Education website as the TJ Papers. So to start with, um, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology is considered by, um, by US News and World Report to be the number one public high school in the country. Um, for many years, admission to TJ was race blind and merit based. Um, requirements to apply included, you had to live in one of five counties nearby, um, a minimum 3.0 GPA, have completed or be enrolled in Algebra One and pay a $100 application fee. Once you met those criteria, um, students could then take a standardized test, um, and at which point, with a minimum score, students would then advance to a semifinalist round, where GPA, test scores, teacher recommendations, and essays would be considered. Last year, however, actually two years ago, I'm sorry, um, the Fairfax County Public School Board, uh, Schools Board and Superintendent adopted a new admissions policy that was aimed at balancing the racial groups at Thomas Jefferson by eliminating the admission test and instead moving to a one round holistic evaluation that awarded bonus points for various factors, such as attendance at a middle school previously uh, with, that had that drew from demographics considered underrepresented at TJ um, and guaranteeing seats for 1.5% of each middle school's eighth grade class. So after all of the feeder middle schools would then allot, um, had their 1.5% of seats allotted, um, only about 100 unallocated seats would remain for the rest of the student body. Um, so all of the students then who didn't get in before would compete against each other. Um, that being said, even in this uh, competitive pool, Things, things called experience factors, which I'll get into shortly, were considered as part of the process. So with this backdrop, in March 2020, a coalition of parents, students, alumni, and community members um, sued um, under a group called the Coalition for TJ um, with the assistance of the Pacific Legal Foundation to challenge these admissions changes. So um, this has been ongoing for a long time, um, and through discovery, as I said, um, the Pacific Legal Foundation had obtained, we received a really shocking amount of documents, which are all housed on our site, um, defendinged.org. If you go in the search bar and you put TJ papers in, you can pull up everything. So we have all of the different um, exhibits that were included in the case. Um, so it turns out that going back to my, um, May 2020, school district staff and board members were considering admission changes without any public discussion. Um, there were some emails that were obtained between the district's general counsel and other board members um, where they were talking about documents that were discussed during a closed meeting of the school board. Um, they discussed initial plans to change the admissions process and noted that FCPS expects that as a result of the changes, the student population at uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, High School for Science and Technology will reflect more closely the diverse population in the jurisdictions from which students are eligible to apply for admission. It's worth noting that the most recent, two years ago, the, um, the, uh, the class that was admitted was about 73% Asian American. And so it's, it's not hard to discern what was considered kind of unacceptable. Um, and 
if you think back to 2020, um, this is around the time that everything happened with George Floyd. So immediately after the George Floyd incident um, on June 7th, 2020, the principal of Thomas Jefferson and Benita Bus, um, uh, Benita T. Bus, I'm sorry, sent students and families uh, an email that outlined her ideal racial objectives for TJ admissions and wrote, First, our school is a rich tapestry of heritages. However, we do not reflect the racial composition in FCPS. Our 32 black students and 47 Hispanic students fill three classrooms. If our demographics actually represented FCPS, we would enroll 180 black and 460 Hispanic students, filling nearly 22 classrooms. The most recent TJ admissions trend, unfortunately, does not close the equity gap. Um, for a school that, as, um, as I said earlier, has a, a large number of Asian Americans, many of whom are first generation Americans, this was really felt as, as seen as a slap in the face. Um, this is at, at the same time all of this is going on, the state of Virginia had set out um, a number of criteria. They wanted to really push the um, schools towards incorporating greater diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives into their schools. Um, Thomas Jefferson is something called a governor's school, so it's, it's a historically excellent school. Um, so with that um, kind of background of what the state wanted to do, um, board member Karen Corbett Sanders wrote to uh, State Senator Scott Suravel and uh, Delegate Paul Krizek on June 8th, um, please be assured that I am as angry and disappointed in these numbers as you are. And, uh, new numbers had just come out showing that it was a, it was a lower number of Black and Hispanic students for the um, 2024 in incoming class uh, that were had low numbers of Asian and Black students. Um, the previous board requested that the superintendent bring to us a plan for addressing the equity and admissions issues at TJ. We have some preliminary discussions, but none of us knew about the numbers. I just got off the phone with the superintendent for the second time, and I've had conversations with Secretary Carney, Atif Carney, who was at the time the Secretary of Education. I believe that there will be intentful action forthcoming, and I will keep you both posted. And so this whole idea of intentful action really spooked um, at least the superintendent. Um, and that was really the thrust for why this was such a, and it was given the impression, the board members were given the impression that this is something that had to happen very quickly. Um, a week later, Karen Corbett Sanders wrote to the superintendent and copied the other school boomers and said, um, the admissions data for the TJ class of 2024 is unacceptable, with less than 2% of the admitting class being Black, a decrease year over year. Um, they the school had a deadline of October 1st, 2022, notify the state on what their diversity plans were. And so she was really pushing and she asked, uh, make sure that the plan includes quantifiable measures dates by which they will be achieved, and information on how you will review the plan to make refinements as necessary. Um, so this is all going on over the summer. There are discussions back and forth. Um, and on September 15th, 2020, the superintendent, Scott Brabant, um, uh, unveiled a new merit lottery admissions process for TJ. Um, and that night, one of the board members, Elaine Tholen, asked the superintendent about his plans for community input. And noted that we were not able to work on this the way that we should have. And so the fact that much of this was being done behind closed doors, the discussions, um, the planning process was, was really a, a matter of concern for a lot of the board members um, who for the most part were very sympathetic to the, the plan of increasing um, diversity numbers at TJ through intentional means. Um, one board member, Megan McLaughlin actually texted another board member and noted that Transparency and authentic community engagement are paramount to ensuring public trust in government. And she expressed concerns that the school board and the public only received the proposal a few hours before a September 15th work session, which in turn prevented board members from examining the merits and challenges of the proposal prior to our public discussion and deliberation. I will note um, just through my work at Parents Defending Education, this whole idea of public input and things being done with that stakeholder and community input um, is really, it's a pervasive issue across the country. And so while what has happened at Thomas Jefferson is certainly egregious, this is far from an isolated incident. Um, it turns out that many elected officials, school board members really prefer to just do things how they want behind closed doors and not have that kind of input because they might get feedback that disagrees with what they ultimately want to do. And so that's part of the reason that we've seen such a significant parent uprising over the past uh, year or so or across the country. Um, in the wake of this rollout, the whole proposal of the merit lottery, it was an absolute debacle. Um, the community was furious. There were protests. Um, and they actually ended up backing down from a plan to just do the, the merit lottery straight up. Um, but again, the, um, the mostly Asian and mostly immigrant parents were really furious, and they continued to um, submit their comments, express their displeasure, and hold protests. 
um, one board member, Karen Corbett Sanders again, um, asserted that all the district was trying to do was to reframe how they assess merit and in, in, in admissions. And so, you know, she was trying to kind of shift the dialogue, but I think everybody in the community really saw through what was actually happening. Um, a week later, on September 23rd, um, there was a video town hall that the superintendent did with the community to talk about the admissions. Um, and he said that um, the race blind admissions test to TJ um, is a standardized admissions test where you can pay to play and get a good score that lets you in versus someone who cannot. Um, this obviously inspired quite a lot of ire. Um, a lot of the families are not wealthy families. A lot of the families, um, they, their, their children have worked very hard for their entire lives. Um, this is a similar allegation to what has been thrown around about the specialized school program in New York City, where parents defending education is currently um, involved in some litigation. Um, and so the fact that uh, in New York City, actually, for their specialized school program, 60% um, of Asian students who have been admitted are at or below the poverty line. And so to assert that Thomas Jefferson, like in New York, this is just purely a pay for play, that families have the ability to throw thousands of dollars at like a Kaplan test prep is um, it's a little bit spurious and it was insulting to the families. Um, families continue to be upset about this. And board member Megan McLaughlin actually said that, um, you know, a lot of the families were fearful in the fact that this was a flawed, rushed plan. This was not fear of change. Um, like the lottery was flawed and said it is rushed when you cobble together a proposal with only three weeks to review and no prior stakeholder input. Um, and she also noted to another board member that six of us don't want the lottery. He doesn't have seven or more members who actually want this. Um, and this is when we saw um, through discovery, a lot of the documents show that what was actually taking place is they were trying to figure out a way to game some of the numbers, um, and they ended up settling on something called a holistic emission policy. You may have you may be familiar with that, this um, concept because it's what we're also seeing right now in the Harvard affirmative action case. Um, so Jeremy Stuckart, who was the director of Thomas Jefferson's um, uh, admissions policy, asked somebody else in Fairfax who had the Office of Research and Strategic Improvement to look at um, a table for experience factors and figure out what current weighting is for experience and figure out where to um, weight things or to level the playing field for historically underrepresented groups. Um, the woman, the, the Office of Research and Strategic Improvement director responded, it's hard to know what exactly will level the playing field, but my gut says you may need to double all the points and the total so that applicants can receive up to 200 points overall for these experience factors. Um, she said that two portions of the application process, the student information sheet and the essay had historically favored white and Asian candidates and went on to say that that means only the experience factors um, are able to help shift the landscape and bring more diversity into play and acceptance of historically underrepresented students. Since experience factors include things that more privileged students are likely to get points on, as well as factors that less privileged students are likely to get points on, the potential advantage from the experience factors is likely to be at most 50 points and more likely only 25 points for most students since they're not likely to get credit for all of the experience factors. Um, so again, this is, they're trying to game the numbers, they're trying to figure out what the right mix is to give to weight um, criteria properly. Um, meanwhile, two other board members, Stella Pekarski and Abrar Omesh, um, we're texting back and forth, kind of joking about this. They said the revised proposal will whiten our schools and kick out Asians. Um, Abraro Mesh said there has been an anti-Asian feel, LOL, um, laughing out loud. And um, Abraro Mesh actually noted they're discriminated against in this process too. Um, there was a scoring rubric that was developed. Um, it was initially, it came out in discovery. It was marked with a confidential watermark. Um, but the, um, the initial formula um, had negotiated a section that actually had something called bonus points. Um, or initial application elements as before, a GPA, a student portrait sheet, a problem solving essay. Um, but the experience factors, which are described literally as bonus points, um, have economically disadvantaged students who have qualified for free and reduced price meals. English, English language learners, um, special education, students with an IEP or individualized education plan, um, uh, underrepresented schools. And so that would, this whole bonus point section would give um, 225 points or 25% or 20% of the total maximum. Um, they ended up tweaking that a little bit further and version two of this rubric actually decreased the weight of the GPA and increased the number of the bonus points. Um, the rollout of this whole thing, unsurprisingly, was a total debacle. Um, in December 2020, 
uh, Megan McLaughlin, one of the board members said, I cannot recall a messier execution of board level work. I feel that Braben's, the superintendent's flawed operational proposals have greatly contributed to tonight's embarrassing process. So um, in the wake of all of this, um, the Coalition for TJ sued the district in March 2021. And on Friday, just this past Friday, um, District Court Claude Hilton uh, found that impermissible racial balancing was at the core of the plan to overhaul admissions. And he enjoined FCPS from using their revised admissions plan um, through the lens of strict scrutiny analysis. Um, as he noted, Impermissible, impermissible racial intent need only be a motivating factor. It need not be the dominant or the primary one. Um, and as all of these documents have shown, it was certainly a motivating factor in what happened. Um, as Hilton wrote, throughout the process, board members and high-level FCPS officials expressed their desire to remake TJ admissions because they were dissatisfied with the racial composition of the school. So. With that being said, that's kind of the overlay of where things stand. It's really exciting. Um, we're hugely excited for our friends at Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, my coworker, Asra Namani, was one of the founding members of the Coalition for TJ. And so she has been on this from the beginning. Um, they have been called names. Um, the president of the Thomas Jefferson High School PTA, who is actually a black NAACP member, resigned from being the head of the PTA because um, he was called names. He had a major fight with the state level um, PTA, um, the PTA, Parent Teacher Association, also being kind of like the National School Board Association, a somewhat captured entity throughout the, um, in the, in the education sphere. Um, but this is a terrific victory. And my coworkers have spent the past several days um, talking to parents around the country. This is much like what we saw in Virginia um, after November has really injected a lot of hope into um, a movement that we have seen spring up since last year. Um, we've seen similar problems at Lowell High School in San Francisco. That was one of the factors that contributed to the recall of the school board members in San Francisco. Um, and so with that, I look forward to taking your questions because um, you know, this, is, this is a really successful um, battle, but certainly you know, the war is not over yet. So with that, I look forward to taking your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so, so informative. And I'm sure our audience appreciated getting a better understanding of the, where things stand and what's happening because so many people have been so curious about what's going on at TJ. So um, I would ask our audience if you have questions to please send them in via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And while we're waiting for the audience to send in any questions, um, I will take moderator's privilege and ask my own question of um, where do you see this going next? So procedurally, so the court just issued a summary judgment decision on Friday, and then what's next? Sure. So the first thing is that um, admissions for next year's class, next year's incoming class, are going on right now. Um, and so because FCPS has been enjoined from using their this new fancy pants policy that they drummed up, um, they have to go back to what, they, what was in place before. Um, FCPS had no backup plan. And Claude Hilton, um, Judge Hilton, had actually you know, kind of implied, you know, do you, do you have one? You should have one. And they didn't. And so it's back to what it was before, strictly, um, st strictly, um, you know, test and then the, the whole interview thing before. Um, and so that's, that's one factor that will happen. Um, the district has not put out a lot of statements about what their plans are. Um, it is, they have said they are considering whether they will appeal. Um, and so I think that's kind of anybody's guess right now. Um, you know, they could take it up to the fourth. Um, it's, you know, who knows what will happen at the fourth, but um, if it, you know, if you go to the fourth, then, you know, someone will probably end up appealing up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, I think in the back of everybody's minds right now is what's going on with the Harvard case and students for fair admissions. Um, and so that's definitely something else that's at play. But um, I think it's, it's something that, um, yeah, litigation, you know, might continue. That being said, we've also spoken to a lot of families over the weekend who are really, really deeply angry. Um, we know at least one father who has filed an OCR complaint alleging racial discrimination in this process. Um, and I know there are two others that are planning on filing their OCR complaints this week. Um, you know, as I have been filing OCR complaints um, for districts across the country over the past year, um, somewhat strangely, the Biden administration has not been super excited to investigate my allegations. Um, and so, you know, that being said, what we have found is when we file OCR complaints, we publicize them. And I think it's, you know, there is a significant weight of evidence in this case. Um, you know, the direct harm that has been sustained is, is pretty surprising. Um, under the new system for the, the class of 2025, um, 
56 fewer Asian American students were admitted than, um, than there were the previous year, despite the fact that the class size actually increased by 70, by 64 students. Um, so the class of 2024 was 73% Asian, the class of 20, 2025 is 54% Asian. And so, um, you know, if, if the statistics had continued the way that they were before, you know, there would have been about 90 more, I think, Asian students admitted. And so that is, I mean, you know, let's think through like disparate impact. Um, those are real numbers and those are, you know, those are real people. And so um, it's a bad look for the Biden administration to continue dismissing all these claims. Um, so we'll see. Great. Thank you. And while wow, we're getting a lot of questions from our audience, which is wonderful. So let's just dive right in. Um, Let's see where to dive right in. I uh, so the Lowell case that you had mentioned, I think it's in California. Is there litigation pending there? Do you see that happening? Um, as far as I have not heard of litigation going on there right now. Um, I know there's litigation in Boston right now because a similar change was tried to. They were trying to do. Um, Boston did a, a similar thing with Boston Latin, um, and so I think this is going to. I think spark a lot of people's. Um, you know, imaginations, whether they should engage in litigation going forward. Certainly. Yep. I, I think you're completely right. Um, okay. So let's, let's turn back to TJ specifically. Uh, what, what admissions policy would the coalition for TJ prefer? So are they asking for things to return to as it was before the changes were made, or are they asking for something different? Yeah, they, they want things to return the way they were before. Um, they like it being merit based. Um, they want the students to compete on, you know, on, on equal footing. Um, right. And one thing that my colleague Asra has noted is um, last year, there were, I think, five students that dropped out of TJ after being admitted. Um, previously, there have been no more than one student year that has dropped out. And so um, I know it has come up in, you know, previous discussions about Harvard, et cetera, about mismatch. And so if students are being admitted who are not equipped for the rigors right. of the school, um, are we setting students up for failure? Um, I think that's something else is, you know, that, that um, is a concern, not only for, you know, newly admitted families, but for families that are in the school, because we don't want to do that either. Right, absolutely. And that's a question that's frequently not asked, but braver people are willing to ask that question, which is good. That's good for the students and good for the school and good for the community too. Um, Speaking of the community, uh, Chuck Roberts asks, what can Fairfax County residents do to support these efforts? Um, it's been really encouraging to watch, you know, the community speak up, speak out about um, what, how their taxpayer dollars are being used. You know, if the district were to appeal up to the Fourth Circuit, would they engage outside counsel? Is that an appropriate use of taxpayer dollars? Um, how much money has been spent to date on their defense of these policies? Um, and how things have been done behind closed doors. I mean, we've seen a lot of recall efforts in Fairfax County, in Loudoun County, certainly, about how school board members have been conducting business. And so I think one thing community members can do is just to try and hold those elected officials accountable. Um, in reading through the discovery documents, you can really tell who's okay with keeping things happening, you know, with the process moving behind closed doors without community input, and, pe and, and the board members who are really uncomfortable with that and feel that they are actually there to represent their constituents. And so that's something that I would encourage residents of Fairfax to look into. Um, I would also note, you know, elections have consequences. Um, the fact that Governor Youngkin, um, the new Secretary of Education, Amy Guidera, um, they have spoken out about what has taken place um, in Fairfax. That's encouraging too, because if this were Governor Terry McAuliffe, um, I, I have no doubt that the state would intervene in a very different stance. Um, and that's something that you know, would be distressing for Virginia taxpayers. And so um, I think continuing to you know, encourage and applaud our elected officials when they do the right thing and hold them accountable when they do the wrong thing and misuse taxpayer dollars is definitely something that's really important. Absolutely, yes. Um, two questions that I'm gonna kind of, going to kind of combine into one, I think. Um, let me read through this. I, I know that you had mentioned in, in reading the summary judgment decision, I know that there's pressure coming from the state. So the state of Virginia that was cited by the board members for making decisions in the, the way that they did it and quickly and behind closed doors, et cetera. So we have a couple of um, couple of participants asking. So one, if the Virginia AG has discussed intervention um, and also whether the Youngkin administration has any control over TJ or if it's entirely controlled by Fairfax County. Um, so wondering, you know, what their involvement or lack thereof is. Yeah, it's um, it's a governor's school. And so, yeah, that the state does have some oversight of that. Um, you know, and we have been watching the um, Youngkin Department of Education really 
start to unwind a lot of the programs that have been hugely controversial and divisive in the Department of Education um, in the state of Virginia. Um, they just recently abolished the department's ed equity division. Um, we, I became familiar with the Virginia's ed equity division when I learned about their, um, last year they sponsored a program on how to commemorate 9-11 in a culturally responsive manner, which included um, only discussing Islam in the context of Muslim first responders, um, not to otherwise, you know, contribute to Islamophobia. Um, that's something that, again, I, like, I'm a Virginia taxpayer that my tax dollars were used for. Um, I find that really objectionable. And so programs like that will not be taking place going forward because that's no longer a department in the Department of Education. Um, I have not heard of um, the Attorney General, the mayor's off, um, off the department, um, moving forward to intervene. But I think, you know, if the case were to proceed, if Fairfax County would appeal up to the um, the Fourth Circuit, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I think it'd be great if they did. Um, I personally, having done a lot of litigation through Speech First over the years, I like when the Attorney General kind of distances themselves from what a, a local um, actor is doing. Mm -hmm. um, because again, you know, this is, they're using taxpayer resources. Um, and I don't want, I don't want two sets of taxpayer resources, you know, local and state being used against me. Um, but um, yeah, Youngkin put out a great statement. Um, the Secretary of Education put out a great statement. And so I think we're all kind of holding our breath right now to wait and see what Fairfax is going to do. Right, that makes sense. Um, another question, this is a, a different level of government getting involved. What about the DOJ? So you said that OCR complaints have gone kind of ignored perhaps. Um, has DOJ threatened to intervene? I'm assuming we know how they would plan on intervening, but I'll let you <laughs> to that. Um, I don't think so. I mean, you know, but all this all happened so recently. I mean, the decision right. came out like on Friday afternoon. And so I wouldn't be surprised if DOJ maybe, you know, wanted to get involved. But I think, again, that's all kind of, you know, depends on whether the case is appealed or if it just, okay, it's been enjoined, like moving on, like let's get on with our lives and, and just like roll things back to the way they, the, the way they were before. Right. Absolutely. And this is my own, own personal thought on this. That's quite the and maybe I'll, I'll just give you the opportunity to comment on the difference between the way that Loudoun County was handled, where the DOJ did get involved and made the statement. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the timing of the statement regarding investigating parents at school boards who were caught like questioning the decisions of board members that the DOJ did issue a statement close in time, at least there's a close proximity in time with the issuance of that statement versus the DOJ not getting involved here. So, um, I guess that's more of a comment, not really a question. <laughs> um, back to the, the questions from our guests. So from Rob Hot, he asks, regarding discovery requests, are you aware of any DOJ interference by asserting that the requests are based in discriminatory, discriminatory intent? No, I have not, nothing, nothing from DOJ specifically. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I from Michael Doherty, what further liability risk, if any, does this place on the districts for any damages already sustained? So um, perhaps the damages you're referring to, like disparate impact, the number of students who were not admitted. Yeah, I mean, I the the, the litigation that PLF did was brought on behalf of the coalition, um, and those are those are some families that were already in the school, some families that were alumni families, some families that wanted to get into the school. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. If, I mean, I guess like at this point, it's um, yeah, at, at this point, the policies are going to be start to be rolled back. But um, I, I think there is the option for people to individually sue and, you know, claim damages. Um, you know, will, will that proceed? I'm not sure. Just, oh, Frank, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm actually not a lawyer. I play one on TV. So um, please don't ask me to speculate about all these things in a super, super informed manner. But um, I, you know, I, I think that it's something that the school should be considering um, because um, while a lot of the public interest firms don't necessarily ask for damages, it is something that an individual plaintiff might want to do. Right. That makes sense. Um, this is because you play a lawyer on TV so very well. I want to ask you about <laughs> the Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of people asking about the um, how you expect the court's decision in Harvard and UNC, so the CERT grants recently. Do you see a bleed over into K-12? through I know that in the summary judgment decision, they were referring to a distinction between uh, higher education versus lower education and when looking at race is appropriate. Um, so perhaps you could speak to that. Yeah, it's been just over the past couple of years, my work in higher ed and then moving from higher ed to K to 12, it's been interesting because there is such a, you know, 
so much you know, symbiosis. There's bleed over back and forth. I mean, bad right. policies that we see at the university level are being um, imported down to K to 12. Students not knowing what's learned, what, you know, not learning proper civics in K to 12 obviously bleeds up to students acting really liberal on campus. And so um, I think that the synergy between the two is really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, seeing how Harvard, you know, in the wake of Grutter and all these other decisions, um, you know, they have claimed, you know, what their what their interest is in this, um, and that, uh, you know, that they needed to bring greater diversity to campus. Um, the speech first filed amicus briefs um, at the cert stage, both for Harvard and for UNC, um, saying that okay, well, like, you, you claim that that's your your reason that you want to foster greater um, diversity on campus. Um, let's look at polling about what's actually taken place on college campuses. Um, there is very little diversity of thought on colleges. Um, if anything, things are worse now. You put in all these places and people are now terrified to speak. And so, um, you know, you have moved to a holistic admissions process and you haven't even ended up with this like magical outcome that you wanted. And so I think there is a strong reason to think that, you know, the whole idea of holistic, I mean, who is at the end of the day, who is making those decisions? Who is developing these weighted criteria? Um, and what is, you know, there's no transparency into how that's happening or why that's happening. Um, and if it's just based on, you know, immutable characteristics that students can't control, skin color, gender, um, I mean, then suddenly you, you have administrators pulling levers trying to kind of like craft like a, 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 a you know, a, a student body um, without really, I mean, it, 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 it checks boxes, but it's not actually creating a better student experience. And so I think there is, yeah, I, I do think that there is, cause for hope that that what happens with Harvard and, and UNC is going to really be a game changer for the K-12 space as well. Right, great. Um, let's see, speaking of the student student body, uh, what is the sentiment, Steve Schaefer, one of our um, attendees asks, what is the sentiment among the Thomas Jefferson students to the, to the degree that it can be measured on the fairness of the admissions criteria, striving to create a desired student body made up, made up of certain students and against others. So exactly what we were referring to. Um, I'm not sure how that could be measured, but um, maybe your organization is collecting that kind of data. Yeah. Um, so the, there was the coalition for TJ opposed the changes to the merit policy, to the merit-based mm -hmm. admissions policy. There was um, a parallel group that was, that was in favor of the policies they wanted, they claimed they wanted a more diverse student body. And one thing we've seen, not only kind of in the TJ setting, but in other schools settings is um, a willingness of some advocates to use children as talking, talking heads, as sort of like a, a shield. Um, it kind of feels a little bit like um, the, um, who's the climate change one, Greta Thunberg. Um, and I know that the coalition for TJ has not done that. You know, they made a very intentional decision to not try and weaponize children or use them as puppets. Um, and so the, the few students that have spoken out um, have been ones that have been in favor of the new policies to have a more diverse student body. But I mean, I also think about kind of taking a step back, you know, the kinds of work that you know, I engage in with race issues, with gender issues. Um, I mean, almost 99% of the tips that we receive on a regular basis from adults, as well as students, as well as grandparents or teachers, people want to be anonymous. Because if you say, you know what, I think people should compete fairly, you are tarred as being a racist. You are tarred as being a bigot. And so I think, you know, polling has shown just nationwide, people don't like positions, seats being awarded on the basis of skin color, things like that. Um, but they're scared to actually speak out and do so. And so I wouldn't be surprised. And actually, I suspect that most students actually really want, if you have gotten into an extremely academically rigorous school, you want your peers to also be extremely serious about their schoolwork. You don't want to be in a group project with somebody who, you know, is like, you know, kind of on the margin, got in, but is not up to your standards. Um, because those are the people you compete against. Those are the people you work on projects with. Those are your peers. You know, you, you, you compete, you know, you compete against each other. You take pride in each other's work and achievements. And so if you see your classmates start to drop out, you know, it's, I think that's, that that's discouraging as well. And so, my gut is that the students, you know, I think it's probably still kind of seeping into students because, you know, they're, they're at the end of the day, they're like 13 to 18 year old kids. Um, but I suspect that this is not as poorly received as maybe the Washington Post might imply it is. That makes perfect sense, particularly in, um, in light of, I know, I, I don't have a specific one, but there have been a couple of instances in recent years where people have made statements, for specifically high school students have made statements on social media and then a classmate has screenshotted it or a classmate has saved that. And then they're later admitted to college and then the admission is revoked 
based on a previous statement. So that makes particularly for students in a very competitive high school, of course, they would want to stay as anonymous as possible and not jeopardize. Unfortunate that it's the case, but of course they would not want to jeopardize them um, like future college admission or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Okay. So another question, uh, the cited Asian attendance being down as a percentage versus the actual count of Asian Americans who are enrolled as students. Could you, um, I know that you had referenced that earlier, but could you perhaps go through the, the difference in um, attendance prior to the change and then post the change? Yeah, um, I think that was a, attendee logged in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it was, there was like a chart in the decision that I'm like trying to pull up right now because he had like all the numbers. So obviously yes. I can't find yes. it. Okay. Um, okay, so um, in the, cl the class of 2025, which is this most recently admitted class that was under the new admissions process, um, there were 299 offers to Asian American students, which constituted 54% of Asian American students that received offers. In 2024, there were 355 offers extended to Asian, Amer Asian American students, which was 73% of offers. Uh, 20, the class of 2023, the year before that, 360 um, offers to Asian American students, Again, 73% of um, offers extend of uh, the Asian American pro uh, proportion of offers extended. And so um, it, it dropped off precipitously while the class size increased overall. Great. And I think what I will do for the benefit of attendees is I'm going to link the, um, the event page, which includes a link to the summary judgment decision, which if I'm right, has the, um, has the graphs that you just discussed in yeah. it. I don't know exactly where, but I'll put that in the chat so that for people who are interested in going through and reading it, they'll be able to click there and then find the decision itself. Um, okay, wonderful, thank you. And now another question from James Hordern. In Texas, we have a law requiring school board meetings and decisions accepting a few things to be posted and then open to the public. Discussing and deciding quote unquote off the record like this is illegal, does Virginia have a similar law? Yes, that's so funny you say that. All states have an open records law, and we have found somewhat sadly that school boards across the country routinely flout that. Um, so, you know, they can go into executive session, which is one thing, right? You're discussing a lawsuit. It's not going to be on the public record. Um, but a lot of these, I mean, a lot of the correspondence that were received through discovery were actually, they were text messages. Those are still, con those are still considered um, part of, you know, you're, you're conducting district business. Um, and actually in Texas, there was a school district where there were two school board members that were indicted by a grand jury because they were discussing district business on text message in a deliberate attempt to keep it out of the public record. Um, one thing we have found just over the past year, parents defending education is a big fan of filing FOIAs and public records requests. Um, many school officials do not think of themselves as state actors. And so this is something that I encourage many, many, many of you to go out and do. Um, file the request. You, they have to turn it over to you. Um, you know, be smart in what you request, terms, people, um, time horizon, but um, you're, you'll be surprised the kind of information that actually comes out because, um, yeah, there, a lot of people are very, very free in what they email back and forth, um, not realizing that, you know, it can end up on the front page of the Washington Post sometime. Um, so this is, this is very much an instance where they were discussing in explicit detail, you know, what their intent was, their, their, their displeasure with um, the policies. Um, and I think that was so much of it was cited by um, Judge Hilton in his decision that it really did play a factor to show that race was a motivating factor in this decision um, and that it, it made a lot of people very uncomfortable. Right. There's actually, and I think that this was part of the impetus for wanting to put a, put a webinar together to discuss more of what was going on with the TJ and the litigation is there was a Wall Street Journal um, article recently, which highlighted a lot of the evidence, which I think is the same kind of thing that uh, probably exactly the same that your organization, you referenced a page on your organization's website that includes and like lists all of the evidence that came out as far as the racially motivated nature of the decisions that were being made by the board. Um, so I think it was Bill McGurn who wrote an mm -hmm. article a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, same kind of thing. So yeah, really, really um, great and, people. Yeah. Um, last year I filed an OCR complaint against Wellesley Public Schools in Massachusetts mm -hmm. um, okay. because they held racially segregated affinity groups. Um, mm -hmm. In the wake of my filing OCR complaint, um, Judicial Watch filed a FOIA with the district to figure out kind of what what other, you know, what had gone into that decision. And they discovered uh, a lot of really damning emails back and forth um, where the district 
told a white teacher she couldn't attend. Um, they had access to an email that a teacher sent to her class and said, white students not allowed. Um, and we actually, we ended up suing Wellesley and just settled with them about two weeks ago. Um, and the Judicial Watch FOIAs were an invaluable part of our lawsuit. And so it is really, I mean, you don't have to go to discovery necessarily to find like the kill shot. And so I, right. I really, I definitely encourage everybody to, to think of that as a tool in your arsenal. That's great. That's really good for our audience to know. Um, let's see, this is, if anyone else has a question, please send it in. We've gone through a lot of questions, but thank you for sending them in and thank you for answering them. Uh, the last one that we have in the queue for the moment from uh, Jessalino Calaris, does the private public divide in the Harvard and UNC cases indicate that the UNC case is more relevant to your TJ litigation? Which I think, I think if I'm remembering this correctly, UNC is a public versus Harvard being a private institution, and that would be the difference that would make this relevant. Um, but handing that over to you. <laughs> um, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, the Harvard, the Harvard case is being litigated by, and, and UNC, I guess it's, it's been combined. It's being litigated by Constable McCarthy, who Parents Defending Education uses as our, our, as our litigation counsel, but I'm not super up on like the nuts and bolts of, of what that is. Um, I think, you know, the fact that the justices combine the two cases rather than choosing one and, and you know, only taking one or, or holding them separately, um, I think shows that there are overwhelming concern, you know, overriding concerns. Um, certainly Harvard and UNC are both title, you know, they, they're both recipients of federal funds. And so they're both subject to, you know, Title VI. Um, and this is, you know, Thomas Jefferson, it's a public school, you know, it is also obviously a recipient of federal funds. And so um, I, I wouldn't say that UNC is more strictly relevant than Harvard is. Um, I think, you know, the, the overt racial intent, I think is frankly, like in, in the Harvard case, from what I have seen and heard, seems to be, um, a little bit more explicit than it was in UNC, quite frankly. Um, and again, targeting Asians who are deemed to have been historically overrepresented at Harvard. Um, and so I, I wouldn't, yeah, I don't, I think it's hard to say like one way or the other. Gotcha. Great. Um, to our audience, if you have any other questions, please feel free to send them in. Thank you for participating. This has been a very lively webinar. So thank you. Um, do you have any questions, areas that you wanted to cover that we haven't had the chance to Oh, and you know, I'm speaking too soon. We're getting another question right as I speak um, from Alan Smith. I... Okay, so this, this goes to something that you had mentioned about mismatch. So admitting students who may not be prepared for the academic rigors of an institution that would, they would be perhaps better prepared if it was a merit-based admission program versus a holistic program of admission. The question is, what about the buildup of frustration on the students accepted who wouldn't have been by academic performance? Yeah, no, I, I actually just pulled up what um, my colleague Asra wrote. Um, and so she said in, yeah, in school district enrollment figures made public for the first time, eight freshmen admitted through the new race-based admission process dropped out of TJ over just five months um, between September 2021 and January 2022. Um, in the entire school year before just one student dropped out. And so, um, you know, that's that's a large number of students to drop out of a, a pretty small school. Um, and again, those are seats that could have gone to students who wanted right. to be there and would actually stay in. Um, and right. so, um, yeah, you want you want peers who, you know, are there for the long haul and can compete. And, you know, I mean, I remember being a student class and, you know, the teacher having to spend a disproportionate amount of time and energy on somebody who doesn't get class material. I think, yeah, it is a source of frustration for students. Um, that being said, certainly, as we discussed before, um, students, I think, are, are reticent to discuss those issues, um, particularly when there is and there has so obviously been a racial overlay on everything that has happened in the school and the applications and the and, you know, the incoming, um, you know, the incoming students. And so. I think even if students are frustrated, I think they're they're probably reticent to discuss it. Um, but I think it is in people's minds for sure. Great. Um, all right. I think that's the last call for questions. So I'll hand the floor back over to you for any closing comments or any uh, any subject matter that you did not get the chance to address already. And yeah, a, a closing call for questions from our audience. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, I appreciate everybody being interested in this because um, this war on merit that we have seen at Thomas Jefferson is certainly 
taking place from coast to coast. Um, it was a motivating factor in um, getting a lot of people out to vote in San Francisco in the recall elections. Um, it's taking place in Boston with Boston Lantern. And so um, a lot of the city or the, the country's elite schools um, in the name of equity are they're trying to do away with um, with tests like this. I mean, we have seen universities saying they're not they're not going to use the SAT, which is um, as many people on this call know, um, a, a really good determining factor in success in college um, because it is considered racist. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this, you know, in, in the push to 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 drive greater equity, um, we end up seeing the government with its thumb on the scale, holding some people down and trying to lift others up. Um, in the state of Oregon, um, they recently got rid of their graduation requirements um, in the name of equity. Um, they specifically cited BIPOC students, um, which then, you know, implies, OK, um, you think that those minority students are incapable of meeting graduation requirements. A high school diploma in the state of Oregon going forward, you don't have to be proficient in reading, writing, or mathematics. Um, that makes that diploma for everybody else absolutely worthless. Um, and a lot of the parents who come to us, um, they are, this is their first rodeo. Um, they are not political. They are not all Tea Party activists. Um, many of them, many of them are first generation Americans. Um, they have chosen to move to this country. Um, they tell us, you know, don't don't tell my don't teach my son that getting the right answer in math class or showing his work is racist. Um, tell me, teach my kid calculus so he can apply to MIT and make a better life for himself. People are indignant about this war on excellence. Um, and as you know, activists continue to push and push and push and try and erase that excellence. It does a disservice not only to these students, but also to our country. I mean, how can we compete in a global marketplace when we get rid of these programs? Um, we have students that are bored, and when those students are bored, they act out. Um, and trying to dumb everything down to the lowest common denominator does nobody a service. Um, it does not encourage students to thrive. It does not encourage students to strive. Um, and I think, you know, it, it really, it, it significantly weakens us. And so this is one battle in a larger war. Um, but I do, you know, I appreciate you all for caring about this and continue to be engaged on it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, many, many thanks to you, to your organization for the great work that you're doing, to our audience for tuning in and participating. Um, we welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. So if you have feedback, please do send it there. Um, check the chat for the, the link to the summary judgment decision if you're interested in reading it, and also for a link to the uh, Defending Education website where you can see all of the documents that were collected with regard to this litigation specifically. And um, without any further comments, we are adjourned. Thank you very, very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you.